All right, everybody. Well, welcome to our glo uh, global gathering once again. Now, unfortunately, our scheduled guest, who is Jürgen Ziva, as you all know, is unwell, and he has dropped a video for us to have a look at. It's just a 10-minute video, uh, which is the first in his astral overview project. So what I thought we'd do today is we'll have a look at his video first, which is a video about the lower realms. And a lot of people in the new age seem to think that the lower realms don't exist, that it's a, 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 a fictional sort of place meant uh, to scare people. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at Jürgen's video, talk about it a little bit, and then I'm going to show you a PowerPoint presentation that I did at the AREI conference in 2018, which looks at what's the evidence for the lower realms? What's the evidence? What's the evidence that actually tells us what happens when you die? And we're going to look through at the different levels so that you've got a conceptual overview and you can understand what Jürgen's project is all about. So I'm hoping that that will work for everybody. So the first thing we're going to do is have a look at Jürgen's video. Is everybody familiar with his astral overview project, with what he's planning to do? I think most of you have got the concept of it. And uh, in the, in the uh, Friday Afterlife report this week, we put in a little video to give people who don't know what virtual reality is all about um, to explain how it works. So if any of you want access to that, have a look at this week's Friday Afterlife report. Okay, I am on that note, I am going to share my screen and we're going to have a look at Jürgen's latest video. Okay, so here we go. This is his progress report on his astral... Uh This is the first uh, virtual reality app I created uh, for this project and I'm starting on the lower astral levels. I'm trying to get a feeling of what these, the atmosphere is like in these places and it's one of darkness, desolation and a little bit of eeriness the feeling of being trapped and it's quite a big place but it has no way out because it's a state of mind basically and if the state of mind doesn't change then the environment doesn't change. The advantage using virtual reality lies in the fact that you're actually in the place. The video can't really represent this very well, but you can look around, you can look up, and the street you're in and the buildings tower high above you, and you actually get a feeling of being in the place, and you can explore it, walk around in it, and see what it is like. Now the atmosphere doesn't change very much during these excursions and there's a feeling of being stranded. You cannot walk very fast because your energy level is low. All this has been tried to uh, emulate in the experience. There? I need your help. I'm sorry. 
Lauren Plaza. Hurry. Hello? Is anyone there? You received this. I need your help. Come to Darwin Plaza. Please, hurry. Hello? Hello? Is anyone there? If you receive this, I need your help. Come to Darwin Plaza. Please, hurry. Guys, we got another one. Guys, we got another one. <laughs> of course, a flat screen video doesn't nearly give uh, appropriate representation of the virtual reality experience in which you are completely surrounded and you can see and experience the subtlety of what it is like. This app was actually inspired by an out-of-body experience I had and it was very similar, the atmosphere was very similar the fire here, for example, was a place where I found these three people wanting to get out of the place and try to enlist my uh, help. Help me. In the experience, Help me. in the virtual reality app, you can go through the whole town and and climb up ladders and stairs and see every nook and cranny and get a feeling of what it is like. Could somebody please help me? I need help. Please, please help me. What is quite good in using computer technology and game engine design is that it allows you the freedom to recreate an atmosphere or an ambience, for example the sky, which is quite unrealistic, represents a little bit more the kind of different feeling. Uh, an out-of-body experience head or an astral experience. It's not quite the same as we experience reality normally. But um, it's quite uncanny how we can actually trick the body or trick the mind into experience a different uh, Help me. kind of sensibility by using art and environments and atmosphere to Could transmit a feeling please. which is Help not congruent me. with what we normally I experience. Well, I hope this little demonstration gives an insight into the project which I'm going to pursue, where I'm going to be demonstrating different kinds of uh, environments on different levels of consciousness. Now this of course is a very dark level and a very sinister level and it's not really the place many of us, most of us will find ourselves in when we die, but I thought it's good to start at the bottom end and work our way up. So the next uh, VR experience will be the absolute opposite and it will give a feeling, it will be a representation of the experience of cosmic consciousness, which is the absolute opposite of what we can see here and that will be posted next.
All these apps are freely available on my website, uh, magicfantasyart.com. And of course, the work is ongoing, and uh, of course, it requires costs. And if people feel they can contribute to it, that would of course be welcome. But I want to make all these virtual reality experiences totally free of charge, and every, anybody can come down to the website and upload it for free to get a feeling of what I'm trying to convey. So, thank you for watching, and thanks for your ongoing support. Well, okay, so the question is, well, is this real? And what evidence do we have that the, these different realms exist? So I thought we might have a look at that, if everybody's happy to do that. I'm just going to share the screen once again. And I'm going to show you a PowerPoint that I produced a couple of years ago. Of how do we know what's actually there? Most people's only ev awareness of evidence of the afterlife is what comes through mental mediums. And mental mediums generally are more concerned about the proving the continuity of life rather than being able to talk a great deal about what the afterlife is like. And that's because most of the people who contact us from mental mediums are in an area of the astral uh, that's fairly close to the earth. But let's talk about some of the other ways that we know about the afterlife. I'm just going to progress this. We're going to talk about what we learn from independent direct voice, from automatic writing, from instrumental transcommunication, out of body experiences, the best mental and trance mediumship, and organized communication from the higher spheres. So let's start with independent direct voice. One of the things that most people, in, uh, particularly in the United States, don't know is that independent direct voice is different from trance mediumship. Often they think they're getting independent voice because it's coming through the mouth of the speaker. But it's not, this is not what we mean by independent direct voice. Independent direct voice, the spirits are able to create an artificial voice box from a substance in the medium's body. This is what they call ectoplasm, taken from the medium's body. It's usually taken either from the ear or the mouth or the throat. And there it's in the darkness because this ectoplasm is very sensitive to light. But once they create the voice box, they can move the voice box anywhere in the room. And you can hear the voices coming from up near the ceiling. It's, it's quite amazing. What we learn from independent direct voice, and some of you have, are very familiar with the Leslie Flint tapes, which are absolutely wonderful and I highly recommend them. This is one of the tapes where George Wilmot says that he was met by his horse. Uh, one of the things that does come up a lot in the uh, tapes is the existence of animals in the afterlife. I'm just going to give you a short extract from one of the tapes. This is George Olson describes his arrival in the afterlife. Now, what I want you to realize is that George Olson is coming through in his own voice and he's talking to two people there and the medium and telling them what happened. He was actually a, uh, a friend of Leslie Flint, the medium, and he uh, used to come to some of the seances with, with them, some of the meetings. What were your feelings when you first found yourself in? Well, fortunately, I knew quite a bit about it before I came. Yeah. That was a great blessing and a great help. Believe yeah. me, it was. As far as I'm concerned, the place in which I found myself was, I suppose, the nearest one can say is uh, like some country place. Could be anywhere, in a sense. Yeah. I mean, there were 
the trees, the trees and the birds, and just as if one was waking up in a country a village, although in a sense it wasn't a village, I realized that very soon afterwards, thousands and thousands of people, many, many, I suppose what you'd call apartment houses anyway, I can, I suppose that's what you'd call it, vast buildings housing thousands of people, and the animals, there seem to be many, many animals, and indeed I realize there are many animals here, particularly in regard to domestic animals, cats and pets and people have had on earth, you know, that they still have over here. One of the best ways that we know about the afterlife is what's, through what's called automatic writing. And Chico Xavier was a very famous automatic writer uh, from Brazil. And recently they made a movie of some of his uh, descriptions of the afterlife called Astral City or Nosso La. We'll be looking at some clips from that a little bit later on. But there's other automatic writing. There's a lot of automatic writing that comes through about the afterlife. The next thing I want to talk about is instrumental transcommunication. Most of you know Sonia Rinaldi's work, but in the 1990s, there was a group in Luxembourg that were getting pictures of the afterlife. This was absolutely amazing. Mark Macy, if, if you look at his blog called The Beacon, he has got a lot of photos from these, uh, these experiments that were, came through a Luxembourg couple in the, right through the 90s. And this was a picture that was sent through of uh, Victor Rees and Haile uh, Schaefer soon after they had both died. This is another picture that came through the Timestream ITC station in 1990. This was from Jules Verne, and he was describing his, uh, the place that he was living in, in the afterlife. One of the interesting things that we do know about the afterlife is that people grow younger. They go back to being the prime of their life. Now, this was on the photo on the left, you see Jules Verne when he died at age 77. And in 1995, he sent a picture of himself in the afterlife through the Timestream group. The Timestream group also got this video. Uh, it's, it, this is on Mark Macy's page. Hannah Bushbeck, when she died in 1984 at the age of 78. And this is the picture of her that was received in 1987. We know that young people also grow older in the afterlife. They grow to maturity. On the left, you have a picture of Ezra Braun. He died of cancer at the age of 12 in 1986. And he sent this picture of himself through Timestream in 1992. Now, apparently the satchel, the strap over his shoulder is very evident, was very evidential to his parents. Ezra was very fascinated with China and his parents took him to China and he was able to get one of those Chinese bags that uh, the kids were wearing in, in, the, in the time of the Cultural Revolution. And apparently he was still wearing it in the afterlife, which is interesting. Source four, we're talking about, we learn a lot about the afterlife from out of body experiences. Jürgen is one of a long line of out-of-body experiences. Perhaps the most famous is Emanuel Swedenborg. And he was a Renaissance genius and he began having out-of-body experiences at the age of 55. And like Jürgen, he spent 27 years exploring the different levels of the afterlife. Now this was at a time back in the early 1700s when the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church were saying that there's heaven or hell or purgatory and uh, he was reporting that there's a very similar life to earth that people have bodies they live in houses they have a community they're surrounded by landscapes like on earth there are familiar plants and animals 
And he talks about it being very vivid and much more alive and that what we see responds to what we're thinking. It's almost exactly the same as what Jürgen is talking about. Now, if you uh, have a look on the internet, you can see that there are some wonderful videos for, by the Swedenborg Foundation that uh, portray a lot of the details of his teaching about the afterlife. Jürgen's work, as we know, is uh, quite unique in that he is an artist who draws what he sees. And he's had 40 years of out-of-body explorations, more than 40 years, in full waking consciousness. And he's also uh, now working on this series of virtual 3D videos about the afterlife. If you're interested in Jürgen's work and what he sees in the afterlife, he's got a lot of videos on YouTube. And of course, he's got his website, Multidimensional Man. The next source I'd like to talk about is some of the best mental and trance mediumship, particularly the mental and mediumship of the early 20th century. Now, there's too many wonderful mediums here to talk about, but if you want to find out, I strongly recommend these four books, The Afterlife Revealed by Michael Tim, Heaven and Hell Unveiled by Stafford Betty, Your Eternal Self by Craig Hogan, and The Realities of Heaven. I forgot the name of the author of this right now, but I can tell you a little bit later. Then we have communications from the higher spheres. We, what we do know is groups of spirits in the higher spheres come together and in mass and try and portray the pr truth of the afterlife through various mediums. One of the best collections is the Spirits books by Alan Kardec. Then you've got Stainton Moses, Spirit Teachings. Silver Birch in 1938, Hugh Benson, which came through Anth medium Anthony Borgia in 1955, and then A Course in Miracles through Helen Shushman in 1976. Hugh Benson is a very interesting one. He's probably the most frequently read description about life in the world unseen. He wrote a series of six books, now, what was interesting about Hugh was that he was a Monsignor in the Catholic Church. He actually worked in the Vatican. And while he was alive, he wrote books saying that spiritualism was evil and people were contacting the devil. And when he got to the other side, he was terribly upset about this. And he really wanted to correct what people thought. And he, he, he had a whole group of spirits. It was a huge project that they would come through and uh, give a correct account of what life in the afterlife is like. And it, it wasn't just Hugh Benson. He was the spokesperson for a big project. And he came through a, a very good trans medium in England and uh, he also came through to his friend, Anthony Borgia, who he had known when, uh, when he was a teacher in uh, England. Now, Anthony Borgia, this is what was really interesting because Anthony Borgia received the information uh, himself. And then on the following Saturday, he would go and sit with this medium and Hugh Benson would take over her body and really communicate word for word what he'd already given Anthony Borgia. So it was a double confirmation that he got everything right. And so that particular book, Jürgen says it's very accurate about life in the world unseen, and it talks about all the different levels of life. Now, many researchers have tried to create a map from all of these sources of what's in the afterlife. And one of the earliest that I came across was George Meek in the 1970s. He wrote a book called After We Die, What Then? And this was his description of what happens of, of the afterlife and where you're likely to end up. He talks about the earth plane here. You've got the earth plane. Above the earth plane, we've got what we call 
the astral levels. And most people who die go to the astral level, the astral level, which is the areas closest to Earth. But they're divided in, into very different areas. We've got the lowest astral planes, the middle astral planes, and the highest astral planes. Now, we're going to have a look at some pictures which depict those levels. And you'll see that the highest astral planes are less Earth-like. They're more like what you see in the movie Avatar. The people who go straight to the highest astral planes are those who live a life of kindness, harmony, love and service. And according to George Meek's research, this is the proportion of people who go to each of the levels. This one, as you can see, is a fairly small proportion. The middle astral level is what they call the summer land. These, where you get average, kind-hearted, considerate, hard-working adults, all infants and children go straight to the middle astral planes. Then we have what they call the lower astral, lowest astral planes, and there's not just one. There are hundreds of different areas where you have people who are selfish, materialistic, unloving, greedy, and cruel. One of the best sources that actually talks about all the different levels is a website called Steve Bacow's New Maps of Heaven. Now he's done a fantastic uh, research putting together conditions on each of the planes. For the time being, I'd just like you to get the concept of the words. He talks about the borderlands where people first awake the astral plane arrival, orientation, the common sum, summer land elements. He talks about the higher summer lands, the lower summer lands, the, uh, the, the stony plane, the dark plane, uh, the, the second death. He also talks about the mental plane and the Buddha, Buddha plane. He talks about the children's spheres and work on the astral. Now, all of these he actually gives specific references to where how he found out this information. So I strongly recommend Steve Becker's New Maps of Heaven. Now, this is a pictorial representation that I put together a couple of years ago. And a lot of these has come from Jürgen's work. And he talks about the lowest realms being where people are in isolation, that it's a very dark, dingy, uh, kind of life and what he talks about is that you can tell the level of the, the of the area in the afterlife by the amount of light in it so the lower realms far from being a fiery furnace are actually dark and cold this is one of Jürgen's drawings of people perhaps it's a little higher because people are no longer isolated but they're still in pretty horrific uh, conditions and this is very similar to what they talk about what uh, Hugh Benson talks about in life in the world unseen as things as you go higher the realms become more earth-like but Jürgen talks about them being very dilapidated and this these uh, scapes gradually become more earth-like as you come to more higher vibrations, but they start off being very rundown and seedy. And I think you can see that this kind of environment reflects a certain state of consciousness. Gradually, as you move up the realms, you come to earth-like realms, which basically a lot of people could not tell the difference between the earth-like realms and our realm. Now, Cyrus Kirkpatrick talks a lot about this in his out-of-body experiences. And what we do know is that there is an astral equivalent to every city. We know that a lot of people who are out-of-body explorers go to these areas and they find that there might be something just slightly changed. They often talk about going to their astral equivalent of their, their own bedroom. And it will be just like their bedroom except there'll be a few things different. 
and uh, that's that's very fascinating as we move up the areas this is getting into the mid astral which is more like uh, the kind of area that most people will end up and i mentioned earlier that we had a uh, wonderful work by chico javier and was made into a movie called nosola and these are a couple of slides from the movie they talk about hospitals in the afterlife that when people are rescued from the lower realms they go into rehab and even people who have been sick for a long time often have to go to hospital when they arrive in the afterlife uh, they talk about healing through lights through color and um, I've been assured that this is a fairly accurate representation of hospitals in the afterlife this is also from Nosola. This is where we're talking about cities in the afterlife. There, uh, here you have a, uh, a city that they described. This is uh, where we're talking about the halls of learning, universities, uh, science uh, facilities, where people can uh, study with experts, leaders in the field. They talk about recreation, lakes and boats, music. And this one is from Jürgen. As we get higher in the level, we find beautiful cities, amazing futuristic cities. I love this one from Jürgen. He talks about that there's tourism and entertainment on the, on the middle astral level. And he talks about having visited a 10 star resort which uh, where, where they have everything that we have on earth and, and far more now we're moving into the higher astral levels and what we find here is there is a more intense connection with all life so that you if you think of the movie avatar where people feel very very deeply connected with life and this is the sort of thing that you can expect on the higher astral levels. This is um, from Jürgen, one of his paintings. And this is one of the environments that he's bringing to life in his astral project. And he talks about the colors and sounds being far beyond anything that we've ever experienced. They all, just about all of the people who come back from the afterlife talk about the colors. It's one of the first things that they, uh, that, that they that impresses them and they talk about the the fact that the trees and the plants are actually alive and we can communicate with them now as we get higher we find that the light changes and the light becomes much stronger and more beautiful and you have this sublime light that emanates from everything that exists now, that's about the end of what we know about the astral level. We do know uh, there aren't too many people who move beyond the astral because to go beyond the astral, you have to let go of ego and all attachments to earth. So that you have to forget that you were, um, that I was Wendy Zamet. You have to be able to let go of your identity. And Jürgen is one of the few uh, that I know of, uh, apart from uh, Yogananda, who is able to describe what it's like on the mental planes. And he talks about that it feels like you're moving through colored clouds or mists, but there's intense feelings of joy and bliss, and everything positive imagined can become reality. You can actually create your own reality of what you want. Uh, he says it's it's Im almost it's impossible to put it into language and we know that communication from the mental planes with earth is very difficult because your mind has changed one of the things that we know from the work of uh, silver birch is that those who are communicating on the mental planes have to have a medium to communicate with earth and Again, this is the area that Jürgen is, um, one of the areas that Jürgen is going to be trying to portray. One of the things that we do know is that how do we get to the higher planes? Um, well, this, this is from George Meek, which I really love. 
and he talks about the fact that as we continue to grow uh, mentally and serve others we will increase our vibrations so that that's where we'll automatically end up well that's just a bit of an overview and I'm hoping that that gives you a bit of a bit more of understanding of what Jürgen is trying to do that he is actually going to be presenting a virtual reality uh, so that people can put on a headset and experience themselves in different areas of the afterlife. I think you'd agree it's pretty stunning. It's something that has never been done before. And I'm thinking about how this could be used to take away the fear of death. People who are perhaps in a hospice or terminally ill who want to know where they're going could actually be given an induction tour while they're still alive. I don't know. I think it's pretty exciting. 